I want to just turn to Hebrews 11, and uh, we'll read uh, about this woman, Rahab, and we're not going to spend all the time on Rahab. We're going to go to Rahab, and then we're going to go to uh, the, uh, the entire uh, beginning of these walls that were torn down at Jericho. We're going to try to make some applications, some personal applications in our own life about what God would be saying to us personally. Uh, I believe that God did not just bring revival to this place that we could sit down and enjoy the fruits of revival. I believe he wants to challenge. I believe God has allowed some things to happen because he wants us to see that he can do something in a moment of time. He can change existing conditions. Yes. And, and I believe, I mean, how, how could we not be encouraged by faith? If there's anything that has encouraged me, it's the fact that videos have gone out from this place. Videos. And people have been saved watching videos. I mean, that, I'll never get over that. I don't think as long as I live. I mean, maybe you'll take it for granted, but I don't. I'll never get over that. I mean, you realize how, how preposterous that would have sounded to you uh, five years ago, prior to five years. How many of you think that would have been pretty a preposterous statement? So a video, go, maybe one, you know, that could happen, Randy. I, you know, somebody, you know, some weird go, I get out there and they see a video and they, you know, they get... But I mean, all the people, it's happened over and over and over and over and over again. That amazes me that that could literally take place, that lives could be changed. People that are on drugs. I mean, I never will forget the one story that, you know, about this family and, and uh, this, the, the, the sweet little lady had, the, the, the mother and wife of the family, she had, uh, she had these videos uh, of Brownsville. Her husband wasn't really interested and her son was on drugs and she didn't even know it. And so they go to bed, they have a, a basement that has a, a game family room, and then there's, of course, the first floor, and then there's a, a second floor where the master bedrooms and bedrooms are. And so this boy's downstairs, he's a teenager, and he's downstairs, and he is looking, you know, he's just looking for something to do because he's getting high. His parents have already gone to bed, it's after midnight. And so he's downstairs, and he begins to just pick something up to watch. And he just happens to pick up a, a Brownsville, revival service and he puts it in and he starts watching. Now the amazing things to me is he watches it all the way through. That's amazing to me. You know, that he doesn't just push the button and say, oh, that's certainly the wrong one. Take it out, you know. It just So here he is and then uh, he gets through the video and all of a sudden the parents start hearing this cry. It startles them. Wait, it's loud enough to wake them up two stories up and so they come running downstairs trying to find out what it is and there's their son flat on his face, bawling his eyes out on the carpet, crying out to God and asking him to save him. You know, and, and as a result, as a result, the, the husband, I, I don't know if he was saved before, but it, he became on fire for God because of this miracle that he saw. Now, I, I don't know, that's an unlikely place to find faith, you know, yeah. to me. The whole point is that we ought to be looking at things like this and saying, God, if you can do something like that, what could you do in a moment of time? Yes. And so I'm excited about it. I want you to look with me at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. Now, I don't know if you've ever stopped to think about that, but this tells us the dynamic that was involved in the walls coming down. It didn't just happen because God said, I'm going to make it happen. By faith. Are you hearing me? By faith, the walls came down. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. Verse 31, by faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient or in unbelief, as the King James says, after she had welcomed the spies in peace. Now, the Bible discovers faith in a lot of unlikely places, strange places, places that we wouldn't look. That's a great encouragement to me, as I said. And uh, here's this doomed and cursed city of Jericho. It's already got a curse on it. And it's exactly the kind of place where you would expect to find no faith, none whatsoever. And, and here's this woman found here by the name of Rahab. And the name Rahab means tumult. I don't know. Sometimes the Bible is prophetic in, in naming these, these names because um, God has a plan and a purpose. And how many of you know God was well at work in your life before you ever became a Christian? Before you ever made a decision, he was, he was well, well at work in your own life. 
That's why some of you are here today. Because <laughs> some of you wouldn't be here. I mean, you got in so much of a mess and you, de you, you walked the dangerous line so much that you probably would have been dead by now. You know that? Something would have happened, but God was there even before you cried out to him. Now, that's his sovereignty. That's uh, his providence. But this little lady is a remarkable, she, Rahab the harlot. And, and her name means tumult. And uh, a tumult means disorderly or agitated. Uh, it, it talks about the mind of the emotion, the emotions being stirred up and weak and in chaos. Now, I don't know if that's the condition that her parents lived in so that whenever they had this baby, they named her Rahab because their lives were full of nothing but tumultuous events. I don't know that. Or maybe God just intervened because she's certainly living in that now. She's living in a tumultuous state. And, and, and she's someone you certainly would not expect to possess faith. You wouldn't expect that. Uh, and, and it says here, she perished not in the King James. It says, uh, by faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient. As I was reading that, the thing that struck out, that stuck out to me is that here's a woman who lives in an environment that is cursed. Now, we live in a cursed environment. You, you go to work every day, and, and I would tell you, there's junk that gets on your mind and everything else because, now, unfortunately, uh, those of us who, who are able to work full-time in the ministry, uh, we don't have to experience the same thing. And I'm, I'm saying this honestly. I, I, I pray for this church, and I pray for uh, the people because I know that you're out there facing things uh, that uh, maybe we as ministers, Richard, don't have to face. You know, we get to talk with people. We get to be surrounded by by people of faith and we get to be surrounded by circumstances and that's exciting but some of you have to go to work in a very tumultuous place in a place that's uh, that's cursed and, and but here's the point that really struck me is that there's not any reason that she should rise up but it tells us that she perished not among those people that were full of unbelief and you probably most of you in this room probably work in an atmosphere where there's more unbelief than anything else. It might be a religious atmosphere, but it's probably a lot of un unbelief in that atmosphere. And, and see, here this little lady refused to perish where people were dying. She refused to be like what was around her. She made a choice. You know, faith is a choice. And she made a choice not to perish in unbelief with them. She perished not with those who believed not. I want to tell you something. Whenever you go on to believe God, whatever you're trying to believe Him for, there's always somebody that's going to be around you that's going to be one of the believe nots. Yeah. And you try to stretch yourself a bit, you're going to find somebody that's going to either look at you, talk to you, uh, try to influence you just because of their unbelief. And, and it can drag you down. Sometimes it can be in your own household. Sometimes it can be, I mean, you can do that to each other. Sometimes it can happen uh, where you're uh, hoping to get uplifted all the people say, well, I, you know, you're just a little strange for believing God for that. I bet, I bet there's probably, if we did an interview, there are probably people that have something on the inside of their hearts that you've never shared with anybody else. It, it's, some, it's a dream or it's a desire or it's something that you want God to do. You've never really shared it with anybody. Number one, because it's almost unbelievable for you what God may be saying to you, that you don't want to share it to sound like you're ridiculous or, or foolish. And, and then secondly, you don't want to get put down. And so there's probably some people right here in this auditorium that, that are just like that. But I want you to know the thing that impressed me about Rahab is she made a choice. This is impressive what she came out of. And of course, the fact that she's a harlot. Uh, she, it's even more amazing when you consider that this is sometimes called the Hall of Fame of Faith in Hebrews 11, but there's certainly some good company here. She's the second woman mentioned. And I'm going to tell you something. She's got, a, she's got a, beautiful, a beautiful line ahead of her. Here's this harlot. And now what she's going to be, first of all, she becomes the, uh, uh, she becomes the great grandmother of a man by the name of David. <laughs> and not only that, but she's listed in the lineage of somebody even more important than that. His name is Jesus. I'm you, God knows how to beautify your life. Are you hearing me? When you walk by faith, I don't know what you've been through, where you're going, or what's going to take place, but God knows how to beautify your life. In fact, turn with me to Psalm 149. I hadn't planned on doing that, but let's just look at it, because Psalm 149. 
I don't care where you are or what you're going through. God knows how to beautify your life. Now, Psalm 149 says, Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song and His praise in the congregation of the godly ones. Let Israel be glad in His Maker. Let the sons of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing. Let them sing praises to him with timbrel and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. Now look at verse, the last part of this. He will beautify the afflicted ones with salvation. Now the word in the King James, I'm not sure what it means, but it says he will, he will beautify the afflicted ones. So what does the King James say? It, with what? The meek, he will beautify the meek with salvation. Now, what that means, salvation means wholeness. It doesn't just mean the day you got saved or the day you made a commitment. What God says is, if you're meek or afflicted, if you, I, can, I, can take, I can take your life no matter what you've been through and I can beautify it. I, I can take a Rahab the harlot and I can make it beautiful. I can do things and, and I, I know he can save us. And I know he can deliver us from harlotry. And I know he can deliver us from drugs. And I know he can deliver us. But can I tell you something? Being delivered is not enough for me. It shouldn't be for you. God is not just wanting to deliver you. He's wanting to beautify you. And we've said this all along. He's got a plan for your life. Well, he does have a plan. And that plan probably is bigger than you imagine it to be. I know it is. Because he says that whatever you dream or think, he's always thinking something bigger. It says that whatever you ask or think, he's able to do exceeding abundantly above that. So if you can imagine whatever you have got planned for your life, whatever you think, if it's on target with God, he's got a bigger plan. And that's what he did with Rahab the harvest. Now, my Bible says that the power that functioned in her was called faith. That's what it says. And I want to call it triumphant faith. The name of our series is Finding Faith in Unlikely Places, and tonight's message is triumphant faith. Now, this woman had a triumphant faith. Now, the, the beautiful thing about this, turn with Joshua. Let's get directly into her story. Let's turn to Joshua, the second chapter. And there's just a few things that I want to point out. There's so much we could say. Like I said, I love Pastor's message the other day uh, about Rahab. And, uh, but here's what struck me about Rahab, I guess, as much as anything, is that as I begin to read this story, and you, you know the story. If you don't, then go back and read Joshua sec, the second chapter and Joshua the sixth chapter. Now, uh, what amazes me about this story is that she lived on the wall. Now, why would that be so important? Well, because I'm just going to give you my theory of this woman. If you were to... Uh, live on the wall, it would be like owning an oceanfront property. Maybe a small place, but it was, that's where the breezes are. It was a special place. It was, uh, you can go back and read uh, early uh, in ancient history, and, and the wall was reserved either for guard houses and watch places, or it was reserved for, for somebody uh, uh, that had some influence. I, how would a harlot do this? I have a theory. I could be wrong. Um, if you disagree with me, you could be wrong. But, but I have a theory. I have a theory that this woman was a harlot and a prostitute to some pretty influential people. I, I have a, a theory that when she begins to talk about what they had heard about what had happened to Israel, or what had happened to, uh, in Israel, how uh, they had gotten out of Egypt, I don't know if that was, uh, I don't know if that was well-traveled, if that news was, but she begins to talk about, in fact, if you look with me, uh, verse 8, now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land. Now, that's a pretty powerful statement. Do you understand what you, I know it's already yours. There's no doubt in my mind. I know it's yours. And that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. In other words, uh, everywhere you've gone, there has been not enough opposition to stop, to stop you. Now, the first thing that I, I'm saying is that she has developed this from the history of faith. And if you want to grow strong in the Lord, then you're going to have to grow in the history of faith. 
Did you know that every one of you have a history of faith? You wouldn't be here if you didn't. One thing I see about the book of Acts is that they were so excited, and there's a number of reasons why they were so excited. Number one, they were saved, genuinely saved. If you're genuinely saved, that means you've been generally touched by God at least once. It also means that uh, He will touch you again. Are you hearing me? I mean, if He's touched you once, He'll touch you again. And they were able to draw from that kind of faith that God would touch them again. And the other thing, too, is that I also noticed in the book of Acts that they, when they noticed that the devil was upset, they knew God was up to something. I mean, every time I read in the book of Acts when they were punished and the devil's upset, they got excited. They began to cry out to God and they started crying out things and praying things. God, they'd go back into God's spiritual history. I noticed that every time they prayed, they'd start talking about how great God was. And they'd go back into the history of God and find out things that he had done for his people before. If you want to have strong faith, immerse yourself in the history of God. Make sure that you're aware of the history of God. What he's done before, he will do again. Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, these are simple principles. It's not depth that I'm teaching tonight. It's just a simple principle of a reminder. Why I say that is because a lot of people face a problem and a difficulty, and they, they, they squirm and, and they doubt and they battle as to whether or not it's God or whether or not God will be able to do it. And most of the time, we don't question that God can do it. We just question he'll do it for us. But we don't spend enough time in his spiritual history. And his spiritual history indicates that he never really needed a person of great faith. He just needed somebody willing to learn faith and to walk by faith. Does that make sense? So wherever you are, what God is looking for is not for you to sit back and say, Oh, I wish I had more faith. I mean, that's the worst thing you can say. Nobody ever said that. They did say, uh, increase our faith. But where did they have their eyes? They had their eyes on him. They, were, they saw him so mighty and so great. They said, Lord, increase our faith because of the things he was doing. So don't ever put yourself in a box where you begin to say, uh, Lord, I don't have enough faith. Because God's willing always to increase your faith wherever you are. And if he can give faith to a harlot that knew little, what can he do to you? Are you with me? All right, now notice, notice what happens. Um, she goes on. And she says in verse 10, For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when he came out of Egypt, when you came out of Egypt, and what, uh, and, and what, the, the, uh, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan. And the verse 11, And when we heard it, our hearts melted, and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now here's what amazes me about this lady. She's adding statements to this. I have a feeling, this is my theory. I have a feeling. By the way, if y'all make it any darker up here for me, I am not going to be able to read my Bible. I have a lot of faith that I'm going to be able to read this Bible, but I want you to know I'm on faith right now. If, if it gets any darker... Somebody's going to have to come up here and read this thing. Thank you. Okay. I just noticed the, light, the lights just, it was either my eyes or the lights. It just kept dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And I thought, well, wait a minute here. Okay. But there are statements that she makes. Like she heard about the victories that God had won, but where did she get the idea he was God of heaven and earth? Are you with me? Where did she get the idea that he was the God of be that that he, she's calling him because she is able to stretch her faith. And I want you to understand the principle that I see here is that no matter how much or how little you have right now, if you just take what little bit you have, what little bit of tr knowledge that you have and stretch it out a little bit, that is sufficient for God to do a great and mighty thing in your life. Yeah. Now, the other thing I see about her is that she was given, she was given some instructions uh, we find that in, in uh, we find that in chapter uh, two, verse eighteen. Unless when we came, unless when we come into the land, you tie this cord of scarlet thread in the window through which you let us down, and gather to yourself into the house your father and your mother and your brothers and all your father's household. 
And it shall come about that anyone who goes out of the doors of your house and into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we shall be free. But anyone who is with you in the house, has blood, his blood shall be on our head if a hand is laid on him. But if you tell, look what faith will do. Would you see that? But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be free from the oath which you've made to us. Now, what they said to her was this. They said, whenever you see us coming, tie this cord out the window so we can see it. You know what she did? Look at this next verse, first one. And she said, according to your word, so be it. So she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. I want you to know she didn't waste any time. They have got to go all the way back to their camp. And then they've got to come back with an army. And they're going to march seven days. She didn't waste any time. That's something about faith. Act on faith now. Don't sit around and wait and say, well, if I do this and do that. When you get a word, not just a word that comes that you, I got a word from God. But when you begin to see something, step out and act on it now. Now, the other thing was that she didn't just tie it on there. She nailed it down. The word for tied there means she fastened it. She securely fastened it. Now, that's the only thing she's got to go on. All right, now, I'm just picking up some principles from this to show you where we're going. But her faith pulled her up, not only out of her transgression, not only out of her guilt. So many Christians live with guilt that they shouldn't live with. So many Christians live with failure that they shouldn't live with. And a lot of it's because we're just struggling with this idea of faith. Do you understand God can find faith in unlikely places? He can find it in your heart no matter what you feel that you have or you don't have. That's, the word, that's what God's trying to tell us. Now, what I want you to see is that there's also a risk to this. There's always a risk to faith because what happens was the king comes directly. And that's why I believe that I believe that she had some kind of affiliation with the high up people. And, and she was probably a prostitute. That's why I think she heard these rumors. I think she had, I think she was probably present when she heard some generals or the king or some leaders saying, have you heard? Have you gotten information about this God of the Israelites? And here she is, here she is probably serving as a prostitute. And she hears these things and all of a sudden her heart begins to leap. So this is God. This is the God of heaven and earth. I'm telling you, it doesn't take a whole lot. It just takes acting on the little bit that God gives you. I believe what God was, I always used to read this statement. If you have faith, there's a grain of a mustard seed. You can say to this mountain, be uprooted and cast into the sea. You know what I always focused on? I focused on the mountain being uprooted. And I turned it around because that was what was big in my eyes. I think, man, if I just had, I mean, he said if I had just a tiny, tiny little bit of faith. I mean, I got this great big mountain and it's not moving, so that must mean I don't even have a mustard seed work. How many of you ever done that to yourself? See, that's not what he's saying. He's not trying to say, if you had this, then this would be happening in your life. Or if you, had, if you just had a little bit more, this would be taking place in your life. You know why he's not saying that? You know why I know that? Because he didn't expect you to generate it in the first place. He said he gave you a measure of faith, and he said he is the author and finisher of faith, so it all depends upon him in the first place. Are you hearing me? So he's never looking at you and saying, you filthy thing. You, if you just had a little bit more faith, this thing would be out of your life now. He's not saying that. He's saying if you would understand that if you would have faith in me and you turn and look to me and you look at my spiritual history and you look at what I declare about you and that I'm in love with you and you look at what I've said about you and you make sure there's no sin there so that there's no hindrance for me doing what I want to do. If you would understand, I don't have to have somebody that has big mountain faith. I just have to have somebody that's willing to act on the little bit that's there and I can move mountains. See, I think a lot's been mistaught about faith. And we're always looking at our faith moving the mountains. But he's, he says, have faith in God. Have faith in God. If you want some mountains to be removed, that's where you need to start. As you focus upon the spiritual history of God, get it inside you. I mean, just as much as you can. If you're struggling with believing God for something, review the spiritual history of God and believe that he could be talking about you. All right. Now, having said that, let me, think, let me tell you what I think 
she is defining faith as. What is faith as taught by Rahab? I believe it's faith is believing that God can do something unusual in your life. And once you believe he can do something unusual in your life, act on it. That's what I learned from Rahab. And she takes the risk of faith. You know, in uh, 1 Kings uh, chapter 18, there's a story uh, about, uh, about this man by the name of Obadiah. And Obadiah had hid uh, 50 prophets in a cave. And Elijah comes to him and says, Now, I want you to go tell Ahab. I want you to go tell Ahab about... Uh, the fact that I'm going to shut up the heavens and I'm going to meet him at such and such a place. And Obadiah, Obadiah says, wait a minute. If I do that, I know what's going to happen. I mean, if I do that, the moment Ahab gets there, God's going to whisk you away somewhere and you're going to be gone and I'm, I'm going to be killed. And then he says, don't you remember? I hid 50 prophets in caves. And what he's trying to say is, hey, I don't want to step out. I don't want to step out and do that. I mean, hasn't what I've already done been sufficient? Look at the things. I've already made a risk before. Friend, you cannot expect God to do mighty things in your life if you're not willing to take a risk. So you know what Obadiah was spending his time doing? He was on a grass hunting expedition in the midst of a famine. He was trying to find fields of grass to feed the cattle. Now, I say that simply for this. Rahab was willing to step out and take a risk. Now, you are not going to step out and see a God do what he wants to do unless you're willing to risk something. If you're not willing to risk something, and it could be your pride, it could be, it could be fear, it could be embarrassment, but step out and risk something. Obadiah, we're many people are like that. You've done some things for God, but you won't step any further because what now you're... In the midst of a famine, you're looking for grass. In other words, you're looking for something to keep, to keep alive what's already been. Does that make sense? You're trying to keep things on an even keel. You're just, you know, I'm trying to live like this. God doesn't want you to live where you've been. He's always got a higher place for you. He's always got something that's exceedingly beyond what you're doing now and what you can even dream about. Now, that's the God I read about in the Bible. How many of you read about the same God? All right, now... Here's some things we're going to look at with her. Because there's something that I see about her faith. Her faith must have been visible. Look with me. Look with me at chapter 2, verse 16. And she said to them, Go to the hill country, lest the pursuers happen upon you, and hide yourselves there for three days, until the prisoners or the pursuers return, then afterward you may go on your way. Verse 22. And they departed and came to the hill country and remained there for three days until the pursuers returned. Now the pursuers had sought them all along the road and had not found them. Let me tell you the other thing I learned about faith from her. Faith is able to influence greatly other people. I don't know if you know your geography on this, but I looked it up. If they head to the hill country, can I tell you something? They are headed in the opposite direction of where the camp is. And you realize that these men have come in and they are believing a harlot to give them directions on how to get away from the pursuers. They are laying their lives in her hands. Can I tell you something? There's somebody out there that's around you that's wanting to lay their lives in your hands if you're walking by faith. If you're radiating faith in God, I'm not talking about this great faith that moves around. If you, there's somebody that comes in contact with you that is looking for an opportunity to trust God. They need some direction. See, she told them to go to the hill country. The hill country is in the opposite direction, which was wise because as soon as they got rumor that there were some spies there, they went out and sent an army after them to try to pursue and capture them and couldn't find them. Had they gone the way that they wanted to go, they would have been killed or probably tortured. I'm just simply saying that this faith of Rahab in an unlikely place these spies had to hear her look at her face. If somebody were telling you to do that, wouldn't you examine their face? <laughs> wouldn't you look at them real hard and say, uh, you know, wait a minute, now I've got to trust what this harlot's telling me. She is telling me to go in that direction. My camp is in that direction. My safety, 
where my army is, where those that will fight with me, they're in that direction. She's telling me to go to this direction. And I'm simply saying that there are somebody, there's somebody, if you're walking by faith, if you're walking with God, let me just take out by faith, if you're walking with God, there's somebody that's looking to hook onto your arm. Now, you may not know it or recognize it, but I'm telling you there's somebody that's willing to listen to you because they see something in your life. Now, you see, that's why the devil wants you to feel like you have no faith. Because it's not just your life that's at stake. As long as the devil convinces you that you have no faith, you're never going to step out in a direction where people will begin to watch you and they will want to hook onto your arm and they're going to go with you. Does that make any sense? So I'm trying to tell you that the devil will do everything he can to keep you from taking a risk and stepping out and trusting God. Not just because of your life, but because of the life of somebody else. All right, now let's, let's get into this a little bit because I, I, I want you to go with me. I want you to go with me to Numbers chapter 13. Because I want to go back a, a little bit. The story of Rahab is that this wall that she lived on, that whenever God brought the Israelites to face Jericho, that this wall that she lived on was the only thing left standing. Now picture this in your mind. She's on the wall. I don't know if she was in a corner. I don't know if it was in the middle of the wall. It does not say. It just simply says that she lived on the wall. Now, some way, somehow, God disconnected the whole wall on both sides. When the walls came down, he disconnected it on both sides, and little old Rahab was left there with her family. Now, let me tell you something about the walls. I first saw this when I was in Israel several years ago, but I, I recently picked up something else that in recent archaeological discoveries we have found, I say we, I didn't really have anything to do with it. But, but it sounds important, we have found. Last time I dug in Israel, we found this wall. So I, I'm not an authority on this, but I, I did find it interesting reading that they have discovered that there are two walls, that Jericho actually had two walls. One of the walls was about six feet thick, and there's a great deal of debate about how tall it was. Nobody really knows, but they assume that it was, it was probably not very tall. The wall that we're always talking about and looking about, looking and thinking about, was a wall that they have found out that was about 12 feet thick. Now, Rahab could have had a, a nice little house there. I mean, their houses are not like ours. You didn't put a 3,000 square foot home on that wall. But if she had a 12 foot by 12 foot room or 12 by 20 foot, I don't know what she had, but it had a roof to it and everything. But, but, but they're, they're about 12 feet thick, but about 30 feet tall. Friend, that's three stories. That's a pretty formidable wall, don't you think? And, and God came and he caused all the walls to fall down. And the only thing's left is this, <laughs> this is amazing. This just wall sitting here with this house on top of it, or this room. Everything else is gone. But when I read that, I, I, if it's true or not, I don't know if it was in the same sense, but, but, but scholars believe that it's so. You know what hit me? He said, when we're trying to believe God by faith, it's often the inner wall that's the largest and the most formidable. You know, if we have, if we conquer the inner wall in our Jericho, that's what looks so formidable. That's where people struggle the most with faith. If we can conquer the inner wall, the outer wall looks a lot smaller. And, and in Numbers 13, when they're going through this whole, whole thing about, about where, they're, where they're going to... Uh, where, where they're going to go, it, it says uh, um, Moses gave them some instructions. Let me find out where, where I want to read. Yeah, 31, but before they get there, here's what he told them. Verse... Uh, Verse 21, so they went up and spied 
out the land from the wilderness of, of Zin, as far as Rehob, look at verse 22. When they had gone up into the Negev, they came to, the, to Hebron. And let's skip all those cities. I could pronounce them. I mean, I could. It would be wrong, but I could pronounce them. Okay, verse 20, 23. Then they came to the valley of Eshkol, and from there cut down a branch with a single uh, cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between two men with some of the pomegranates and the figs. They had spied out this land. Moses sent them out under the instructions of God and said, so what kind of land is it? And I, one verse, it's in there. I'm not even going to try to look for it, but it's a verse. It, says, it talks about the cities were, 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 were great and they were large. It doesn't mean that all the cities were large. It means they were well fortified. Every place they looked, they saw the blessings. See, some of you here tonight, I'm convinced, see the blessings of God. In fact, it's churning on the inside of you, and you, you really want to conquer it. But what you see is you see a big wall in front of you, and you, you don't see yourself as being able to do and to conquer these promises in this land that God has set before you. And the biggest problem is you're looking at the wall, but the wall you're seeing is the inner wall. It's the biggest. The wall that's inside you, if you could just get past that. Verse 28. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Now, by the way, when Rahab told the spies to go to the hill country, that's where, that's where she sent them. To the hill country, that's where the giants live. But, but you see, she... She sent them, and they obeyed, and they went, and they came back, and now they're, they're, they're going to, this is back in history, and the thing that scared them stopped them dead in their tracks were these walls. And I wonder what the wall might be in the lives of some of you here tonight. Could it be that you've stepped out in, in faith, and, and you've risked something before, and you failed? Could it be because you always see somebody else able to tackle something bigger than you do? Could it be that you prayed for something, earnestly prayed for something, and as you prayed for it, it did not come to pass, and that backed you off, that wall. When you saw that wall, it backed you off to the point where you're really not praying for anything big anymore. If you are, you're keeping it so secret on the inside, so timid about it. Am I making any sense to you? See, God wants you to step out of that. All right, now turn with me back to Joshua. Back to Joshua, chapter 6. And I want you to see an interesting thing here. Whenever you're considering stepping out by faith, always remember there are two viewpoints. Your viewpoint and God's viewpoint. And what you have to do is to get from your viewpoint to God's viewpoint. In Joshua chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Now Jericho was tightly shut because of the sons of Israel. No one went out and no one came in. Now, as far as they were concerned, from their viewpoint, from their viewpoint, what they saw was a place fortified, tightly shut, impregnable, impossible to conquer. That's what they saw. And I want you to realize that the people are looking at this wall and they are not soldiers. They're not warriors. They're like you, they're like me. They don't have any ability to conquer this wall. It's not a matter, it's not a matter of looking at the walls, but let me tell you this next verse. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and its valiant orders. That word see, I, it just, or behold, it just jumped out at me because if, if I probably was Joshua, I'd probably have a tendency to say, No, I don't see. Are we looking at the same wall, God? <laughs> and God is saying to you, there's a wall there, but do you see that I have already torn that wall down? I have given it as a victory into your hands. Yeah, but I don't see that, God. I've tried this. I've hit that wall before. <laughs> and I've tried to tear it down. It's, but see, you're looking at it. There's a wall that you cannot climb over, you can't tunnel under, and you can't break through. But God has different eyes. 
Let me tell you what God spoke to me one time. He said, that thing that you're, and this was about a particular thing, which I won't go into, but he said, that thing that you're looking at is, the, is a wall cleverly disguised as the impossible. And, and I, I started just looking at it, and, and I got my eyes full of God and started looking through God's eyes, and, and, and I could see what he's saying to me. Didn't mean I didn't have some fear, but I could see what he's saying to me. And I want to say this to you tonight. Sometimes we get this idea of faith that the person of faith steps out there and has no fear. That's not what it means at all. Moses had fear. Read Hebrews 11. They had fear. Moses had so much fear that he went out and tried to do what God had asked him to do to be a believer, and everybody misunderstood him, and Pharaoh began to pursue him after he killed an Egyptian, and he's so afraid, it says specifically in Acts 7, he was afraid and he ran. It's, it's not a matter that it's a God pursued him. Maybe you've had fear before and you ran in a direction or you backed away or you quit. God is pursuing you to say that's not the end of faith. That thing may look to you to be impossible, but it's cleverly disguised because I can see through it. I, and you know how Joshua was, was able to see what God saw? Because we don't have time there, but in chapter 5, if you go back, you find out that he had an encounter with, with an angel, a, a Christophany, a pre-incarnation appearance of Jesus, I believe. He calls it an angel stood before him. Do you remember this? And so Joshua was looking over the land, and suddenly in chapter 5, uh, an angel appears to him and says, Take off your shoes, for where you're standing is holy ground. Can I tell you something? No angel ever says that. What makes something holy is the presence of God. That's the only thing. The tabernacle, when they built the tabernacle, remember hands, human hands were going in there building the tabernacle. Can I tell you something? They walked in and out of the inner, inner sanctuary. Human hands and human feet, workers, until the day came that it was finished. And then God told them to step back. And when they stepped back, they looked up and here came a pillar of fire out of the sky, which represented God's presence, that came right down into that Holy of Holies, the very place that they'd been walking. And, and when that happened, from that point forward, you dare not go in there unless you die. Now what made it like that? The presence of God made it holy. And so this is no ordinary angel. And so this angel is saying, and Joshua says, because he's standing with a sword in his hand, and Joshua says, whose side are you on? And I always like what he said. <laughs> he says, neither one. That's what he said. Joshua's standing there. Who's, are you an enemy or foe? Whose side are you on? Neither. Because God is never on one side or the other. He's always waiting for somebody to get on his side. And that's what he was waiting, and that's what he's waiting for us. See, Joshua was ready to take the wall. I know he was. He had to be ready because, can you imagine this? Can you imagine God getting you ready to take this formidable wall, and he begins to talk to you like this. Now, Joshua, here's what we're going to do. This is the game plan. I want you, in fact, he describes it. You know, he says it right here. He says, um, Verse 2, see, I've given Jericho into your hand and with its king and its valiant warriors. And you shall march around the city, all the men of war, circling the city once. You shall do so for six days. I can see Joshua. He's got his notebook and he's got his pen out. So wait a minute, God, let me get... Okay, six... One, one time around, let me get this down. One time around, six days. What next, God? And seven priests shall carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. Then on the seventh... Wait a minute. Don't go so fast, God. Just a minute. Okay, seven priests, seven trumpets of ram's horns. Now, what's next? On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times. So Joshua's just taking the notes, and, and the priests shall blow trumpets. Okay, what, what's next, God? And it shall be that they make a long blast with the ram's horn. And when you have... You hear the sound of the trumpet... All the people will shout with a great shout and the wall of the city will fall down flat. Right. You're kidding me, aren't you, God? 
But what are you really going to do? You know, I'm convinced of this. I'm really convinced that God, he does things that are absolutely weird. So we will believe him by faith. <laughs> we'll have to walk by faith. Has God ever done anything weird in your life? Has he ever asked you to do something? Because what he does is he brilliantly disguises the impossible situations as impossible when really and truly all he's waiting on is somebody to trust him, to take his instructions. You know what he has to do? He has to get us from doing it our way to doing it his way. I believe the biggest problem is not how big your faith is. I believe the biggest problem is getting from doing it our way to doing it God's way. And so sometimes God presents us with something that's a little bit weird so that we will have to trust him by faith. In other words, it goes against reason. It doesn't work the way we think it should work. Can I just share some of the things that that might be with? I, I want you to, I, I was, uh, saw this the other day for, for the first time. It may not mean as much to you, but it meant a lot to me. I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. You know, I have figured out why that shout was so loud. Because if you had been marching around for six days doing the same thing every day, and on the seventh day you got to do something different, you would do it enthusiastically. <laughs> That's why they shouted so. It says a great shout. But, but let, me, let me just, what I, the picture, and I want to close with this, so if you just bear with me these ten minutes. What I want you to see is that God will put you in circumstances even when you fail. He's, this is a story, it's a most, one of the most wonderful stories in all the Bible, and he ties it with a harlot by the name of Rahab because I believe what he's trying to say to every person in this place, listen to me, I can find faith in you in the most unlikely places. I can cause something to happen in you that will be phenomenal if you'll learn to stop doing it your way and do it my way. Now, some of the places that I see that, do you remember when they went into the land? Here's what they said. They said, this land's got, it's got grapes. Here's a sample of the grapes. Look at how big the harvest. You wouldn't believe what's, it's a wonderful land, milk and honey. It's everything we could want. Nevertheless, there are giants there. What does the word nevertheless mean? Let me tell you what it means. It means, yes, your facts are correct. Yes, this is the way it is. This is the way it looks, and this is the way it is. See, some people try to walk by faith ignoring the facts. God does not ask you to do that. He doesn't ask you to ignore the facts. He asks you to say nevertheless. All right, now let me just show you some places. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm going to read a hint. I'm going to read from a smaller print Bible. This one, this one is... Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, this was the King James because the New American Standard doesn't use the word nevertheless. And it's got, I have to use the word nevertheless for my sermon to work, okay? So, he, I want you to look with me. First of all, it's what God, God is wanting us to see. Are you with me? All right? Now here, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. Here's some things that, that may be walls in your life that need to come down, inner walls. First of all, let me just simply, if I could be preposterous enough to say this, maybe you're upset at the way God dealt with you. Maybe God took you through something that you felt was unfair. Maybe God took you through something that you thought was just too hard on you. Maybe God took you through something where it was black and you just did not understand. Let me look at this. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. Now, no chastening. For the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Maybe God was allowing you to fail in something that you tried to trust him in before because he was taking you somewhere. Maybe it's because there was a chastening, a discipline that he had to do. It's the chastening is not 20 stripes on the back. It's whatever God must use through trial and through difficulty to get you where he wants you to be. And you looked at that thing and you said, well, I can't have much faith because I failed in this. And God says, no, you missed me. That was a part of the process of the faith I wanted you to have. What I wanted you to do was to come to this place where you would say, 
I like this. No, no chastening at the present time is joyous. I agree. But grievous. Now look at the next word. The King James says it. Maybe you're trying to say it. Nevertheless, listen to this. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Could it be that what you thought was a failure of faith and not having faith was an exercise in discipline that God was doing in your life to get you from where you are to where he wants to take you and you moved away from it, you quit because a wall came up, you felt unfairly treated or you felt like you turned it in on yourself and you said, I failed. And God's looking and says, wait a minute, listen, I can transform that into an afterword. Listen to this, nevertheless, afterward. Let me break it down. Afterward. I say it this way, it's a play on words. God has the last word. God has the last word. You failed. You were chastened. Some things were disciplined in your life. And it didn't produce what you expected. But afterward, God says, I'm not through with you yet. I've got the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Turn with me to Luke 5 very quickly. Luke chapter 5. Are you following me? Well, there's four of you, so I have to start all over. You remember this one. Peter's fishing. He's fishing in a boat. And here's what God asked him, verse 5, Luke 5, verse 5. And Simon, excuse me, verse 4. Now, when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft. Let down for a catch. Do you understand what Jesus was asking them to do? He was asking them to do something that they had already done before for hours. He was asking them to do something that was very unlikely. Why? Because they'd been fishing in the nighttime. I tell you, I'm not a fisherman, but I do know this much. It's easier to catch fish in those cooler waters of the evening than it is in the hot, glaring sun that's beating up on the waters. Now, what happened is this. He was simply asking them to do something. They'd been toiling. Is there something in your life that you have become weary of? You've been toiling at it. You've been laboring at it. And, and you're so weary and you're so tired. And right now, your mental attitude is there's no use to throw something or to try it again. There's no use to go back to it. There's no use because it's not working. It's not working right. And God simply says, Throw it over there. And you know what they said? Listen to this. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we've toiled all night and have taken nothing. Say this with me. Nevertheless, say it with me. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And I just wonder if there's not somebody here tonight that God is asking you to recover something that you've given up on and if it's there he'll cause that thing to rise up on the inside of you as a faith and a hope again and you say nevertheless i'm going to pray something that you're weary and weary and weary in and god says trust me by faith and what am i going to do god i've tried and tried and i failed nevertheless nevertheless at thy word i'll do it i mean you're following me Turn with me to one last one, and we'll close with this one. Second Corinthians chapter 7. Try, try not to move around. I just, I will, I'll close with this. I'll probably preach on it for about 30 minutes, but I'm going to close with this scripture. Second Corinthians chapter 7. <laughs> I like this one. I know what this one feels like. Verse 5. For when we were come unto Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. Now listen to this. But we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. And you may be facing something. You've been fighting and battling the same thing over and over and over. I mean, you've been pressing. You're tired of fighting. You're in a place where, God, I don't want to struggle against this. I don't want to struggle for this anymore. God, I'm... 
And now there's some fears because of the trouble that's come on every side. There's some fears that are beginning to build up in your life. Let me tell you what the next verse says. Say it with me. Nevertheless, God. Nevertheless, God. I don't care what you've been fighting against. I don't care what kind of trouble you have on either side. God is asking you. He can find faith in unlikely places. He can find the mustard seed in you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He can find the part that's almost died in you. He can find it. And if you'll just cry out, I am so troubled on every side. I have, listen to this, I have fightings on the outside and fears on the inside. That's not a very likely place to find faith. But faith steps out and says, set with me. Nevertheless, God, it changes everything. It changes everything. I want you just to bow your head with me just a moment, would you? And I want you to, I want you to take that part of your life that the Holy Spirit may be dealing with right now. And I want you to put your nevertheless in there, your cry of nevertheless. Yes, God, I've got a wall on the inside that's bigger than anything I'm looking at on the outside. It seems it's, it's three stories high and 12 feet across. I want to tell you something, at the shout of the nevertheless of trusting God, that wall crumbled. Can I tell you something else? I believe God's saying this to you, that some of you have given up believing God by faith because he's taken something that was precious to you. I feel somebody, I feel this, something that was precious. I don't know what it is, but something precious. It was gone. You know what God did? Here's what God did with Rahab. As long as it was necessary for God's purposes, he preserved her house. But when it came time to move her on, they removed Rahab and all of her family outside of her house, and they burned her house along with everything else that was burned. And some of you have been holding on to something that God is saying, I'm moving you on, and he's moved you out of it, and he's burned it behind you, but your eyes are still back there concerned about what God didn't do or what you lost or what didn't come to pass, and it's keeping you from moving to the place God wants to take you. Are you hearing me? And it's time right now to say, God, nevertheless, I've been toiling, and I don't understand why you're asking me to do this again, but nevertheless, I'll throw the net over there at thy word. Nevertheless, Nevertheless, God, I've got fightings on the outside, fears on the inside, and I, I'm, I'm fearful. I'm going to take the risk. I'm going to step forward. Nevertheless, God, you change everything. Or maybe, maybe you're, you're simply like that person that's felt like that your whole life has just been, God, when are you going to stop disciplining me? When, that's been, when am I going to... When am I going to graduate? When am I going to step out into what you're really saying to me? When am I going to be that which I think you've called me? God, what am I going to do? Nevertheless, I'll trust you, God, that through all of this, there's a yielding, an afterword. You've got the last word in my life. The afterword is going to be what I need to move forward because what I've experienced is not the last word. There's something you're going to yield in my life, and I'm going to trust you with it. And right now, i just like for, if that speaks to your heart, and, and maybe it's something in the past, and if it doesn't speak to your heart right now, then register it because there will come a time in your life when you'll need it. But I want you to just lift it up to God right now. And I want you in your own heart to God say, nevertheless, God. Nevertheless, God. Did you get that? Nevertheless, God. And I'm asking you, God, for the faith to step out and take a risk. I'm asking you for the faith to defy the fear. I'm asking you for a fresh move in my life and on my heart that I might tear down that wall on the inside that's been blocking me. And I want you right now to present that as an offering of faith up to God and just simply say, Lord, here I am. Here I am. If you've been mad at God because of the chastening, you need to release that. But you just simply lift it up to God and you just say, God, here I am. I'm asking you to take me forward. Jesus, I'm asking you to receive the offering 
of our faith, which is your faith that you gave us as a measure. I'm asking you to blow upon it. And I'm asking you, Lord, whatever we're looking at, nevertheless, those walls can come down. As they present the walls to you, Jesus, as we present them to you, Lord, it's that inner wall that keeps us from moving forward, that fortress that's on the inside of our Jericho. Lord, let it be leveled that that which is accursed can be left behind and we can move forward into the blessing you've given us. Lord, let a fresh shout be made evident in the hearts and lives of every person that will yield this to you. And Lord, may we understand that it's not that great faith. You're looking for that, that faith that steps out and says, I'll trust you. I have faith in you, God, wherever I've been. And you can find faith in unlikely places. Lord, I'm asking you for strengthening of desire and vision and a strengthening, God, to press on into you. That those here may pick up that which has been left behind because they gave up. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Oh, yes, the baked goods that are back here.